Well, happy Father's Day once again to everybody out there, and I want to say happy Father's Day to everyone. Uh, and I just want to encourage you today on this Father's Day to understand, I want to just reiterate how important it is you understand how much God loves you. And I want to let you know that today. I want to let you know whatever you're going through, that God loves you tremendously. And so uh, my name is Eric Gucci, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Cornerstone Church. Is this your first time joining with us today? We want to welcome you. Also, if this is the first time you've been back in a long time, I'm beginning to see new sm smiles I had not seen in over a year. We also want to welcome everyone that's watching online and everyone that's at the lake or the beach. So you need to make it nice and loud so they can all hear you. Nice and good. Let's welcome everybody. <laughs> and it, it's so good. I'm excited. My mom and dad are coming, and they'll be here for the third service, I believe. So I'm excited to have Father's Day. My parents, they haven't been here in a long time, and so it's great to have them come. And what a wonderful day it is. I also want to encourage you, one of the things that I've learned as a, as a parent, being a father, one of the things I love is when I see our children working together, solving issues. I love when I see our children getting along, right? Well, you know, I'll tell you one thing right now. God loves when he sees his children working together and getting along and doing things together. When I see, when I see um, Luke be good to his sister or his brother or vice versa, it just warms my heart. I love when I see the children help each other. Well, you know what? We want to provide you an opportunity to help us to become more like the children of God. God does not want us all by ourselves, but join into a group. So we're having small groups. They're a little more abbreviated this summer because we recognize the fact that they're about six weeks or so. But nevertheless, we want to encourage you to get involved with a small group. And so as you walk out of here today, you'll see these um, booklets and opportunities for you. If you would like to be in a small group, but there's no small group available, could you do us a big favor? Could you maybe contact us through an email saying, I would love to get in a small group, but I see nothing there that fits my schedule. And you know what? We think it's that important. We'll find a way. Because God loves when his children spend time together. And it makes us stronger and better. I also want to welcome everyone that's watching online. I don't know about you, everybody, but I'm hearing week in, week out. Pastor, it's so good. It was great watching online. But it's so much better to be in person. And I look at Sunday morning like uh, going to the table with the family, having a family meal together. So I want to encourage you that today. Well, we're in a series uh, called Unshakable and how you and I can work and be an unshakable in a world that is shaking. We've been going through for quite some time now, and it is a study through 1 Peter, and it talks about how you and I can live in a hostile environment, a hostile culture, a culture that is not friendly to your faith. And even how to deal with each other and how to deal with your boss and how to deal with the government and how to deal with all these issues. First Peter's been all about that. And Peter was one of the great disciples, one of the top three, if you will, close to Christ. He wrote this in about 50 AD. Persecution is rising in the church. The church is having a difficult time. Nero's just coming to power. And they're going to go through, if they had not already, tremendous persecution. And they have to really understand, how are we to walk through this? Well, today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Today we're going to talk about a, a very serious passage where it talks about, ever hear the Apostles' Creed? Okay, I, I remember I did it as a Presbyterian growing up every week. And one of the most peculiar uh, statements I never understood, it says, Jesus, he descended into hell and rose again. Did Jesus go to hell? What's the deal with that, Right? And what happens to all of us when we die? Now, what a great thing to bring up on Father's Day. But you know what? God loves us so much that he wants to save the world. So today we're going to talk about something interesting. Did Jesus go to hell? And what happens when you die? How do you like that? Okay? But in the middle of that, we're going to look at one of the most difficult passages of Scripture to interpret hands down. And we're going to show us... Okay, we'll do two things, twofold today. We're going to show, I'm going to show you how, a little bit how I came to my conclusion about this difficult passage and to kind of help us all to know how to interpret the Bible. How do you understand what it means? And one of the goals we have at Cornerstone Church, really one of the goals, is we want to help every person that comes here, number one, come to know God, to find a freedom through Jesus Christ and, small, and, and other, each, each other, to discover the reason why you're alive, and then make a difference in this world. 
And one of the ways you discover who you are is through the Word of God. And we want to, we, our, one of our goals is to help every single person to know how to read the Bible for themselves. That they don't have to rely on somebody else. They're able to be self-feeders. And that they know how to grow themselves in their faith. One of the greatest gifts, I, I, I pray, and I, you're going to be hearing more and more about this. I think it's so important in these coming days that you and I know how to get a hold of God for ourselves. This is not just, quote unquote, for the professionals. This is for everybody. But today, let's go through what this is all about. Unshakable, a study in 1 Peter. Let's get right into it. Here we go. We're going line by line, verse by verse. Now we're in 1 Peter uh, 3.18. Here we go. For Christ also suffered once for sins. I'm going to read the whole passage, and then we're going to go back and break it down, okay? Here we go. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Here's the part that gets a little funky. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience. Wait a minute, baptism saves you? And Jesus went to hell? Hang on. Hang on. Okay. The, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So we're going to look at this passage right now, but we're going to, first of all, talk about how, what do you do when you come to a passage of Scripture when everyone knows, if you're a believer in Christ, baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. Well, why does it say that there? And did Jesus go to hell? Well, what's going on? Where, who hap what happens when we die? So we're going to look at some how we deal with difficult passages, okay? I like what Martin Luther said, the church reformer. He said this about this particular passage in general, verse 19 and 20. This is what he said. He says, a wonderful text this is, and more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for certainty what Peter means. This comes to these passages of Scripture that are not that clear. And some other areas that are not that clear is the second coming of Christ. How does he come? When does he come? We know the grand scope of things. And by the way, we will have a series probably next year on, this, on, on the end times. So how do you deal with these things? How to understand a difficult passage in the Bible, all right? I want to help you with this because as I was studying this past week, and you know what? I don't just want to tell them what I believe. I want to show them how to do it a little bit. So I'm going to give you some general principles to help us to learn how to interpret the Bible. But before we do that, I need to tell you a very important story this Father's Day. There was an older man that was hard of hearing, and for Father's Day, the family bought him hearing aids. So he got him fitted. He went to the doctor, got these extraordinary hearing aids, and, and he never told his family, so he went back home. About two weeks later, he went back to the doctor. The doctor said, well, how does your family like what's going on? They must love the fact that you can hear. He said, well, I didn't tell them yet. He said, well, but I changed my will three times. <laughs> so I had to throw that in there to make you laugh because this is kind of serious. Okay, here we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Four things you should not do in understanding the Bible. These are things you should not do. Okay, here, here's the first one. Don't turn to Google for answers. Okay, Mr. Google or online, yes, this is the problem. Everyone has a platform today, everyone, from a 14-year-old kid in the basement with his pajamas on to a 45-year-old kid in the basement with his pajamas on, and everyone likes to write and blog and have ideas. There's a lot of crazy stuff out there. There are groups of people that are siloed, siloed into little subgroups, and you can find something for everybody. So please, do not trust Mr. Google unless you know good sources to go to. Is that clear, everybody? I'm just telling you. Because you can find all kinds of stuff. You can find that Jesus was an alien and that his flying saucers underneath the White House. All right? Don't look it up. Maybe after the service. Okay. Don't assume the passage is unexplainable. I just can't understand it. Listen, it's okay to not understand 
but don't assume it's not explainable. All right? So understand that it, it is explainable. And here's another one. Don't presume the Bible is guilty until proven innocent. I don't know. Imagine if we treated everything like that. The cop pulls you over. What happened? Well, I didn't believe the stop sign. I, I, I just don't know if it is really genuine or not. You can imagine doing that for everything? No. Assume the Bible is correct. And, and, and believe it is the word of God. Now, we had a series, by the way, on how you can trust the Bible. And I encourage you to go to our website, cornerstonecheshire.com. You can click on our sermons, and you can look at a series. I actually talked about the Bible and why and how you can trust it. It's extraordinary. Not my teaching, but the Bible. All right, so let's move forward. Here's another one. All Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Okay? All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in the righteousness that the man of God or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every work. So the word of God is so powerful. And so you may not presume to understand the Bible, but don't assume it's wrong. Assume it's right because it's the word of God. And we talked about why it's the word of God and why you can trust the Bible over any book in the world, hands down. The Bible is absolutely amazing. There is no other book in the world that comes even close to being verified in its authenticity and in what it speaks about than the Bible. I'm telling you right now, it's absolutely, positively amazing, the Word of God. It is the greatest seller every single year, but they don't talk about it because it would always be on the top 10 list, always. So let's move forward. Here's another one. Don't let confusion in a minor issue to cause a crisis of faith. I've seen people read something um, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're going to, oh, my God, I must have done that. I'm going to hell, right? And they're all scared. And they look at one passage of Scripture. It's good to look at everything together. Don't let one passage of Scripture trouble you. Why does it say that you can't mix two types of clothing? What's that all about? Shellfish. And what's, what, I don't understand. And I don't understand what this means. I can't trust the Bible because I have two types of clothing. So, therefore, then everything the Bible says is, is only congruent to that moment? I don't know. Hang on. Hang on. Okay, we'll talk more about that another time. By the way, this series I did, I dealt with these issues. So I'm advertising for you to go to our website and to look it up because I cannot deal with it today. All right? All Scripture is equally inspired, but not all Scripture is equally clear. All right? I hope you understand that. It's equally inspired by God. We believe it is the Word of God. In this church, we don't think the Bible is an allegory. The Bible is like a, a library with 66 different types of books. There's different types of sections. There's poetry. There's history. But we believe it is the Word of God. It is not a buffet line. You just can't take it and leave it and, and choose what you like and choose what you don't like, although we all do it. Come on, everybody. Come on. We all do it. To a certain extent, you and I do it all the time. No, I don't. The fact that you say you don't means you do and that you're really deceived. Happy Father's Day. In 2 Peter 3, 15, 16, it says this. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. Okay, it talks about how God has patience, right? This is what our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom of God gave him, speaking of these things in all of his letters. Now, watch what Peter says about Paul. Peter actually talks about, about Paul's writing as Scripture. So very early, in the very early um, part of the scripture. These books were considered scripture. And yeah, let's move forward. Look what he has to say about the apostle Paul. Peter is complaining about Paul. Look what he says. Some of his comments are hard to understand. So Peter said, he admitted, sometimes the passages of scripture are hard to understand. And those who are ignorant and unstable have twisted his letters. There are people today that twist the word of God for their own personal gain or deception to mean something quite different, just as they do with all the parts of the Scripture, and this will result in their destruction. So even Peter had a hard time. There's some passages of Scripture I frankly don't understand completely yet, and that's okay. But what's so amazing is that the essentials, the most important elements of what we believe in our faith are crystal clear. The errors we don't understand are nuances that have an effect to a certain degree, but they're not vitally important in your eternal salvation. That's what's good to know. 
That's why you can have people that talk about the second coming, people that talk about all these different issues in the Bible, all right? So, how, how, understanding a difficult passage. How do you understand a difficult passage? Here's the first one, everybody. I, just track with me here. I know this is a little, like, elementary, but I think it's important that we go back to the very fundamentals to help us to understand. We talked about sharing our faith last week. This week, I'm going to help you to understand how you can understand a difficult passage of Scripture, and then we're going to talk about Jesus going to hell. And what happens when you die? So hang on. We're going to get interesting in a few moments, but hang on. So how do you understand a difficult passage? Start with prayer. Invite the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he's the paraclete. He will remind us of all things. He will teach us all things. He's your personal tutor. So Holy Spirit, I pray you'd open my eyes. Let me see this passage. I'm telling you, I am so blessed. I go through the Bible every year. Sometimes I miss days, but I keep on moving on. And I'm telling you how amazing it is that God's word speaks to me nearly every single day. I'm, I, I feel like I'm getting washed in his word. It's like taking a shower. I'm telling you, I'm telling you the blessing it is. It's not like I have to. I get to. Uh, you don't have to tell me you have to take a shower. I love taking a shower about three or four times a day in this kind of heat. All right, start with prayer. Check multiple translations. The beautiful thing about having these electronic devices, you can look up multiple translations. Can I just, can I just um, tell you what I think is really good? New King James Version is really good. New American Standard is very, very good. English Standard Version is pretty good. It's good as well. New Living Translation is great for reading, but isn't the greatest for in-depth Bible study. So have several different translations because what they do, they interpret, uh, translate a little bit different and you can get a better idea. Plus, there's all sorts of study helps as well. But check multiple translations. That's the one that you can do. And also, I encourage you maybe to get a good study Bible, um, maybe the Bible Knowledge Commentary or something like that, and you can get those online, and it's on a wonderful app called the Bible app provided uh, by Life Church. It did amazing. Almost, over a billion people have almost downloaded this. This wonderful app will help you. So that's one of the things you can do for the tools, Okay. And here's another one. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. What you do when you come to a difficult passage, you take what you know and you stand upon that. So what you know is what you stand upon. So let Scripture interpret Scripture. Do not take one verse by itself and pull it out. One of the things they teach you in real estate, it's what? Location, location, location. Everything's based upon location. What's the context of the passage? What is the author saying? Where is it found, right? So you need to understand that. That's important. So you need to understand the scope of the book. Then you need to understand each verse and how it fits in together. I hope you understand what I'm saying. So let Scripture interpret Scripture. If you're reading about Peter, what does Peter say in 2 Peter? And what does Paul say about the same topic? What does Jesus say about the same topic? And so you can read the different places and you can find what it means. A great way to do that is a concordance as well. We will show you where other verses are found as well. Do not take one or two verses out of context and make a theology over it. It is a mistake. A lot of problems have happened and arisen in the, in, in the church history because people have done that. So let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. And by, God's Word does not contradict itself. If it does, I don't interpret it correctly. I don't see it that way at all. In fact, I'll see under different circumstances. I'm absolutely amazed how amazing the Word of God is and how you can trust it. I mean, there was a time they used to believe that the King David was a, fit, was a fable. They didn't believe that. But then about 80 years ago, they dug up and they found in Jerusalem, they found, it said, the city of David on one of the, on one of the rocks that was used as a foundation stone in one of the buildings. And we find things over and over and over. Also, consult one or two trusted commentaries and study Bibles. I encourage you to do that. That's helpful along the way. I don't like the ones that tell you everything you believe, but it's good to have some good ones out there. Okay, I'm just giving you some basics here, all right, when you want to understand a difficult passage of Scripture, all right? And here's another one. Ask trusted pastors or believers. It's good to go ahead and ask us. That's fine. We, people ask us. Ask other believers that are trusted and that are strong, and that's one of the ways you can do that. And finally, consider the options and come to a conclusion. It's okay. Based upon this and this and the other, I think the reasonable understanding of this passage is this. 
although I'm going to be humble about it, all right? So I hope I just, I just want to give you some basics right there. Now we're going to talk about hell, Jesus going to hell, and you not going there, okay? So what does that all mean? So let's look at the rest of this passage. Did Jesus go to hell? What happens when people die, okay? We're going to do those two things, and we're going to have a dinner. For Christ, now we go to uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22. For Christ also suffered once for sins. Jesus died once. When he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is paid in full. He does not have to go back. He does not have to redo it. In the Old Testament, you had to continue to do a sacrifice over and over. Jesus was the final conclusion, paid in full. He suffered once and for all. The righteous for the un the righteous for their unrighteous that they might bring us to God. He wants to bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So Jesus died on the cross when he said it was finished, but he was alive in the spirit. But he never, you see, the truth of the matter is you may die, but your spirit still lives. This is a shell. So as we can move on, this is the part that gets a little tricky, which Talking about Jesus now, which he went and proclaimed, which is the absolutely positive. It says preached in some other translations. Actually, it's proclaimed. As you look up the Greek word, it talks about proclaiming. Proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, what's that all about? Is it the Apostles' Creed that he went to hell? Did Jesus go to hell? Did he burn in hell? No, Jesus did not burn in hell. This is not the hell that people think it is which I'll explain in a few moments. He proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited for the days of Noah. I'll wait a minute here. So I can pray for Aunt Martha in South Dakota who's dead, who was an axe murderer. I'm praying, and she's in purgatory, and maybe if I light enough candles and say enough prayers, I can get Aunt Martha out of hell. Is that how it works? There's no Aunt Martha in South Dakota as an axe murderer. I'm just saying that. Maybe there is. Maybe it's a prophetic word. I don't know. All right. But anyhow, so what happened is because they formerly did not obey, but God's patience in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. So what happened? You have a second chance? No, you don't have a second chance. The Bible says it is appointed a man to die once, then it's a judgment. Well, what is this supposed to mean? Did Jesus go to hell or not? Tell me. I don't understand it. How do you know? Well, let's look up. You have to look at the language. Let me just show you my little artwork here. Uh, I know I should be a graphic artist. I'm very proud of myself. It took me a grand total of 15, 20 minutes. Okay. Anyhow, in, in the Old Testament, in the, in the Greek, uh, Hades actually comes from Plato. Plato talked about that. He talked about a place. It was a god of the underworld, underworld, and it eventually became a Greek word. Hades means place of the dead. In the Hebrew, it's called Sheol, if I said it correctly, and that's the place of the dead. So when the Bible talks about it in the Old Testament... When someone dies, they go to the shield. They go to the place of waiting. And you can even see that Samuel is called up by the witch of Endor, which is another story from Seal. So you can see that's a place where people go when they die. All right? In the Old Testament. So basically, Hades and Sheol are considered to be this. And the Bible understands it. Uh, actually, Peter actually uses the word tartus, which uh, even the Greeks believed that there was two chambers in the underworld. One was a, a place of great comfort, and the other was a place of torment. Well, the Bible agrees with that. In fact, it actually says Tartus. Peter actually uses that Greek word, Tartus, which means a place of suffering. So I want to explain to you what this basically means, okay? So you understand this passage. See, what I'm doing now is I'm going to other passages of Scripture. I'm looking up the Greek and Hebrew words. I'm, look, I'm reading other passages of Scripture. So as we look at this, you go to Luke 16, 22 to 29. Jesus gives a parable about hell, about this place called Sheol. Now, I want to encourage you also that the, uh, the word we have in the word, the, the Anglo-Saxon word we have today, hell, people think it means fire. Well, that came later on. That comes from the word Gehenna, which was a valley, Hinnom Valley in Jerusalem, where they used to throw the garbage and burn it, and they used to sacrifice children in the days of the kings. So it was, a, it was a garbage dump that was perpetually burning. So Jesus said hell is like that, as an, as an analogy. So they got the word Gehenna, which basically he got the word of fire. Later on, Jesus talks about the great lake of fire as well. But this Hades here, and the one in this passage, is not talking about that. 
So the Bible never says the Apostles' Creed is wrong. It should not say hell. It should say Hades, that he went to Hades, that he preached to the other people. He proclaimed something. What did he proclaim? Okay, there's different views on this. Well, I'm not going to get into you, but I'm going to show you what I believe based upon the Scriptures, okay? So here is an example of what took place. Jesus gives a parable talking about hell and about the rich man and the poor man. Here we go. So it was in the, that the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That would be the place called paradise. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, we're not talking about being rich as being bad, but this guy who was rich was not a believer. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may tip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So there is a torment that the Jesus talks about in this area. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from the, uh, there pass on to us. Now, what is this all about? Well, hang on. Then he said to him, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, and for I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. So, and basically he says, if they didn't believe Moses in the law, they would not believe me. But if someone comes from the dead, no, if someone comes from the dead, they would not believe. Their heart is so hardened, they won't believe. So what Jesus is talking about here is the place of Hades and Seol. This is not the lake of fire at the end of the age. That right, what happened in the Old Testament, there was a place, and there was two sections of it. One place is Tartus. So this is the place where there is suffering. The people, when you die, you go there. It's like being in the county jail. You've been arrested, but you're waiting. The final verdict is going to happen later on. So you're in the county jail. What this is, is the paradise is a place where even right now, when you die, your body it stays under the ground, but your spirit goes to paradise. Jesus told the man on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. So that's what, so you, what is paradise? Is it heaven? Yeah, it's in God's presence. But one day, he's going to bring heaven and earth together. He's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. We're not there right now. So those that have passed along, that great cloud of witness, they're waiting in the spirit, according to Scripture. So you have Hades. You have these two parts, and you have this chasm here that you cannot pass by. So there's not a second chance, everybody. So what did happen, however, though, you see, what happened was those in the Old Testament days, they believed Jesus was going to come, the Messiah was going to come. So they had faith based upon how they dealt with the faith they were given. So Jesus is on the completion of that. He announced to them, and he also announced to those that, didn't, that rejected him. Now, check this out. There's more to show you. Jesus says this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Son of Man will be there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, the seal, the, the bottom place. So what he's saying is here, like Jonah, and I happen to believe that Jonah died in the whale and God resurrected him. But anyhow, it says that Jonah died. I mean, he was under, I mean, whether he died or not, again, that's an interpretation. But he was good as dead, right? So Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so man, so son of man will be in the belly of the earth. So this is what Jesus talks about. As you can see also in Ephesians 4, 8 through 9, look what it says here. It says, therefore, he says, when he ascended, who's he? Jesus. When he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. So what he basically did is he said they, they had a promissory note. They were waiting in paradise. When Jesus died on the cross, he says, now you have access to the Father. And what happened is Jesus went down there. He has the keys to hell. He has the keys to Haiti. He opened up and he brought them with him. What? Hang on. Hang on. He ascended. What does that mean? But that he also first descended, right, into the lower parts of the earth. It's not burning hell. It was the place of Seol. It was the place of, of rest. Now, 
I want to show you what it says right here in Matthew 27, 50. This is a very interesting passage of Scripture. But what I'm doing, I'm showing you different places where it kind of brings it all together, all right? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit, so he died. And behold, the current, the current curtain, excuse me, of the temple was torn in two. That's very significant. No longer is a priest necessary. From top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. Now check this out. The tombs were also open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and were coming out of the tombs. What? Is this Michael Jackson's thriller video? What's going on here? Well, I'm dating myself from 1982. I apologize. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So what happened? I believe, just as Jesus showed himself, he brought them out and brought them to paradise with him, out of the holding tank to a different paradise. The, the apostle Paul said, I was caught up in the third heaven. Whether I was in the body or not, I do not know. So what we can see is this, okay, that Jesus went down and basically said to those people, I have the victory and I'm letting these people go. I am the fulfillment of everything you prayed for and hoped for and you acted based upon the faith that you had in God, in me, and I am the answer to it all. I am the sacrificial lamb. Behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth. I'm the final lamb. Therefore, now you can come out of, the, uh, of that place into a place called paradise. Jesus told the man on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And that's exactly what happened. So I wanted just to show you what happened here. So Jesus went down. He proclaimed to those that were there. They understood what happened. Wow. Uh, all the fallen people, they understood what happened. Okay? And so we talked about that. He was in the heart of the earth. In Luke 23, 43 says this. And he said to them, truly I say to you, today you will be in paradise. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now I want to continue to look at what the Bible has to say. It says, we are confident, yes, please, rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. One day, our, our bodies will be resurrected and we will receive a glorified body. If you want to know what that glorified body looks like, look at Jesus after he rose from the dead. You can eat fish and pass through walls. It's pretty cool. That's for another time. And now check this out, Hebrews 9, 27. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, after that comes judgment. There's no second chances. This earth is your chance to get right with God. There's a holding tank, yes. But nowhere in the scripture does it say that you can pray for those that have gone before you. You can't. You're responsible for your life and I'm responsible for your life. But Jesus died on the cross for us. Paid the debt. Went in heaven, declared it is finished. Took the saints... And they found their way. Is that pretty amazing? In Revelation 2014, this is what happens later on. Let me show you this. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of the fire. So what happens is that holding tank, they throw it into the lake of the fire, which is the fire that goes on forever and ever and ever. The final consummation of judgment. That's the hell we're talking about. Jesus never went to that hell. I hope you understand that now because I used to be really puzzled by that growing up. Jesus went to hell? Okay, so I hope you help understand that a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to go finish the rest of the passage. I just want to show you a little bit. I, I, hope I, I hope it's been helpful to show you a little bit how to interpret a passage of Scripture, how to use that for Scriptures. I've read a lot of commentaries. I talked to a bunch of pastors, and I really, I got, I fell into a rabbit hole in this one. I mean, I've spent hours reading about 120 different opinions about this. It's amazing. Anyhow, but I looked at it, uh, and I always believe, by the way, that the scriptures are generally pretty clear. If you have to go through a bunch of hoops to make the Bible say something, chances are someone's misusing it. So, so let's continue to read as we conclude our time as the worship team makes their way up. In which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. Okay. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. He's talking to those people that were not obeying. But as you can see in other areas, it shows how he led captive those that were captive in captivity. 
while the ark was being prepared. Now, this is very interesting how it talks about this because they formally did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be when the Son of Man came. What happened? Um, Noah, not Moses, Noah took 120 years to prepare the ark. 120 years he preached. Get right with God. That's our job. And the ark represents, it's true it happened, but the ark represents Jesus. There was only one door in the ark, and God closed it when it was time. Jesus is the only door. And the only way to be saved is to put your faith in Jesus, to step through the threshold of the door of Jesus and get into the ark of his presence that you and I can be saved from the wrath to come. And this is what this is about. God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. You know, I, I, I used to wonder about this passage. It says in the Bible, every thought and intention of the heart was evil all the time. Towards, that's what it says in Genesis. And I used to think, how's that possible? It is possible. Have you seen what's going on in our culture right now? How about this one? Have you looked in the mirror and looked at yourself? I have. And I know without God, I have a fatal disease called sin. I'm a narcissist without Jesus. And that without Christ, I have a fatal disease called sin. And that I can be as wicked as anyone else out there. <gasps> How can you say that? That's what keeps me whole. If you think you're all that in a bag of chips, you're mistaken. You and I are wretched without God. But God loves us so much that he gives us Christ. And it's his preserving spirit that allows us to even know what's going on. So he says this, brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. He's using an illustration about the ark. It was like a baptism. That when you give your life to Jesus, what you're doing, you're getting in the ark of faith of Christ. You're going in the water, and you're coming up anew. You're identifying with Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one comes to the Father except through that, through him. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. The Bible says we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, that Jesus, through him, we have access to the Father. Because Jesus died on the cross, he went to Hades, he unlocked it, and he allows us now to have complete correspondence with God Almighty in his presence because of Jesus. Now that's good news. I wish someone would clap. He's gone to heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. So this is the, this is the good news about Father's Day. For this is how much God loved the world. He gave his only son. We know this already, but I want you to look at it with fresh eyes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So that anyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish, but of eternal life. For I did not come to condemn the world, but I come to save the world. Now let's check this out here. But to all who did receive him, that's Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Is God your father? Have you been reconciled to your father? On this Father's Day, I can't think of anything greater than to be reconciled to your heavenly father. And how do you do that? To all who did receive him. Who's that? Jesus. And believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Who were born not of blood or the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Have you given your life to Jesus? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a few moments. I'm going to ask everyone to be still in this moment. Let me ask you a question. How are you with God? If you were to die, do you absolutely know for certain that you would be with God in heaven, in his presence? If you don't know that, you can do that today. How do you know that? It's through Jesus Christ. 
It's through the door of Jesus, like that ark that saves you. Maybe you're not ready yet. You're welcome to stay in this church. You're welcome to investigate further. God's okay with that. But if you're ready to get right with God, today is the day of salvation. Don't let a day go by without taking advantage of this opportunity. I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. And this begins the journey. You repeat after me in your own heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you rose again from the dead. I ask you right now to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. I receive your forgiveness. And today, I step down from being in charge of my life. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, thank you that I am now your child. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there is a pocket in front of your seat. Also online, there's a phone number. You can do two different things. You can use this connection card or the phone number, which is right behind there. If you want to follow Jesus, please keep that up. Thank you. It's 860-499-4888. You can text BELIEVE to 860-499-4888 and we'll help you with the next steps. Jesus never says, say the sinner's prayer and you're done. There's no such thing. He says, come follow me. Cornerstone Church is a community of people that are following God. I don't have it all together. Our objective is to help each other follow Jesus, to know Jesus, to grow in Jesus, to become more like him. You're here with a purpose. You're here with a calling. And our objective is to help you discover that in community. Amen? And for the rest of us, I hope this kind of helped. Was this helpful? You guys are like, okay, well, thank you. Maybe I'm having a little fun myself. All right. And I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for applause. I, I just want to make sure this is helpful. To, it was helpful to me that I began to look at this. Wow, I didn't realize all this. And this is a part of what's happening, okay? So I want to encourage you that, you know, you can have great confidence in this world. You can have confidence to know when you die, you know you'll, where you'll be in Christ. And that's good to know, everybody. And that gives us the hope and the joy to endure. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. As we, before we leave today, there's one other thing I'd like to be able to do is give you an opportunity to give to the ministries of this church. And you know, something supernatural happens when you give into the Lord's work. The Bible says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. The storehouse is the place where you go to worship. And test me. And see if not, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing, you will not be able to contain it. The Bible says, God loves a cheerful giver. And so we want to encourage you. You don't have to give. You get to give. And this is the four different ways. You can text Cornerstone Cheshire to a new number now. It's 833-245-5608. Go to cornerstonecheshire.com. A push pay app. You can mail it. Or as you're here in person, what you can do is fill out the envelope. As you walk out of here, there are boxes here. And before you leave the front doors, there's two other boxes, okay? So, Father, I pray you would make provisions available for us all. Lord, you promised that you would meet all of our needs. In Jesus' name, we are obedient to your word. We thank you that you love a cheerful giver and that you will provide for everyone. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, as we go out of here today, we're going to have our prayer team forward. If you'd like someone to pray with you, you can do that. If you gave your life to Christ, go to the front desk. We'll give you a Bible. And please let us know. We will contact you if you wanted to be contacted and help you with the next steps. Today, Grove Track step, I think step three, or two, three is today. We we'll encourage you to come to that, what it means to be a leader, and you'll be amazed at all of you are called. Amen? God bless you. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he shine his fatherly love upon you. May you know how much you are loved, that you are the apple of his eye. In Jesus' name, God bless you.